There's a purpose in life while we're living boom, boom. We share a common goal to make it to heaven boom, boom. Shining our lights so others might see We've got a purpose in life We're working hard To be with you Now, John Tillman, Jr. Hello, I'm Minister Jerry Houston, and I'm here at the Garden Oaks Church of Christ. And we're having a marvelous time here doing March Madness. It's an honor to be here with my good friend John Tillman and the great congregation. You're about to enjoy a series of lessons I preach at this great congregation dealing with developing the heart of a champion. We dealt with David, and we lift David up as an example of one who developed the heart of a champion. And I want to encourage you, my friend, to listen to this lesson, enjoy this lesson, and share it with your friends. And also, we talked about the faith that it takes. Because the book says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I know you're going to be extremely blessed by this Holy Ghost Field broadcast. God bless you, and when you have an opportunity, you need to visit Houston, Texas. And when you get to Houston, Texas, you need to go by the Garden Oaks. Church of Christ. God bless you and I know he will because he's good all the time and all the time God is good. Enjoy this word from the word and I know you're going to be richly blessed. Developing the heart of a champion. And as I begin to watch the madness unfold on television and then I begin to think about the theme of this month that your preacher had placed on my heart my theological antenna began to rear up and the Spirit of God began to reveal to me that a champion begins with your heart it begins with your mind but being a champion doesn't necessarily mean you won the championship. There are a whole lot of folk that are inducted in the Hall of Fame who've never won a championship, but yet they have the heart of a champion. And here is the army out there facing the Philistines. And Israel is on one side. The Philistines. They're on the other side. King Saul is wondering how they're going to win this victory. And the Israelite knees are knocking. David is sent by his father Jesse to take some cheese and crackers down to his brothers. And he wanted him to just give him word on how the battle was unfolding. And when David gets down there, he sees this man about nine feet tall, massive, shield, weighs about 200 pounds, has a spear that weighs about 60 pounds. He's mocking the Israelites. And the way they did battle in the old days was each army had a champion. And the warlords would meet one another in the middle of the field. And they would start to negotiate. They would say, we don't have to have everybody fight. Why don't you bring out your champion? We'll bring out our champion. And whichever champion wins the battle, then we will serve your God if you win. You will serve our God if you win. I need to tell you something. The battle you're in is not about you and the enemy. The battle you're in is about your God and the enemy's God. That's why you can't lose because God's reputation is on the line, not your reputation. And God is not going to let the enemy defeat you because if God allows the enemy to defeat you, then God's reputation will be tainted. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I can't lose this battle with God on my side. 
I don't care what the enemy says about me. I'm going to be the champion in my family. I'm going to be the champion on my job. I'm going to be the champion in my community. I'm going to be the champion in this church. As a matter of fact, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, this is the championship pew. And if you're not a champion, you need to get off of my pew. And so you got Goliath mocking the God of Israel. Nobody comes forward to challenge Goliath. He says, send me a man. Send me a man. David comes. He sees this battle, this, this challenge unfolding on the battlefield while he's taking the crackers and the cheese to his brothers. Nobody is accepting the challenge. Nobody is standing up for the God of Israel. David, walking, sees this event. And while David is walking, he's saying to himself, this can't be. This uncircumcised Philistine mocking my God. Nobody is standing. Now, Goliath is an expert in military affairs. Goliath understands the art of war. David ain't nothing but a little shepherd boy about 15, 16 years old, never been in a war, never had to fight a battle, never had on armor, never had a sword, never had a shield. Come here, little, come here, young man, come here. Young man, young man, come here, come here. Look at this young man, look at him. Comes out there, David comes out there, just a little boy like him, little boy. Never had any military experience. Never had a sword. All he did was watch sheep. Give, give your baby up and come here. Give your baby up and come here. Look at it. We got Goliath here. Massive man. Mighty in battle. Always been victorious. Never fought a battle that he did not win. He is undefeated heavyweight champion of the Old Testament. And here comes this little old immature, inexperienced, ruddy lad who just left the shepherd's field getting ready to fight this military genius who is physically appalling, physically terrorizing. But see, God can take a nobody, and God can make you somebody. Don't y'all go nowhere. I want you to see this. God says, I'm going to let you know how powerful I am. I don't need a Goliath so I can make a champion. I just need a little boy who's committed to me. A little boy who's faithful to me. You Bible readers remember in 1 Samuel 16 when Samuel was told to go down to Jesse's house. And you remember when he went down there, God told him, I'm going to show it you, you which one I will anoint to be king. That's just a chapter over. And when Samuel gets down there with the horn of oil, the other boys come out and he thought God was going to choose a king based on the way he chose Saul. He thought God was going to get a six foot five, handsome, good looking man like he did Saul and he was going to make him king. So immediately he went over to the best looking one and he put the oil on his head and the oil didn't run. God said, no, he's not the one. Then he went down the list. God said, no, he's not the one. No, he's not the one. No, he's not. And when he got through, he said, Jesse, are these all your sons? And Jesse more or less said, no, but what I got left, you can't use. 
you got to be careful when you start talking about who God can use and who God can't use. God will take a nobody and turn you into a champion. He said, I got a little lad out there in the shepherd's field. He said, bring him in. David didn't look like much, smelling like sheep, hair all nappy, cucker buds between his toes. Just didn't look like king material. Just didn't look like championship material. See, you don't look like championship material. People discounted you. People didn't think you would make something of yourself. People will always judge you by how they saw you the last time. But they just don't know. God got a few more chapters in your life. And the way you look now ain't the way you're going to look. And the next time they see you, they'll have to say, oh, my God, what happened? And all you can say is, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I don't know where. I got I to gotta finish this up. I told you I wouldn't be long. And so David comes in. Then Samuel puts the oil on his head and the oil start running. God said, here's the one. Now he's anointed king. In chapter 16, God will confirm his decision. When God calls you, he'll confirm you. Did you hear what I said, Goliath? Don't be looking at me like you want to do. Because I'm a champion. I said I'm a, ch say I'm a champion. Say I'm a champion. I'm the champion. Say it like you mean it. I'm the champion. Say it one more time. I'm the champion. All right now. David walks out there. He sees this man mocking his people. David started rehearsing in his mind. God going to give me this, this giant's head today. See, you got to talk it before you can walk it. If you talk it, you will start walking it. There is power in your tongue. That's why you got to be careful what you say about that little baby. You better tell her you a princess. You are special. You going to be somebody. You going to be a doctor one day. Don't be calling your child stupid. You call them stupid long enough and then you shock when they act, when they grow up and start acting stupid. You got the power of life and death in your tongue. Speak over your child. You're going to be somebody. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a gospel preacher. You're going to be an elder. You're going to be a deacon. You are somebody because your mama is somebody. Your daddy is somebody. You come from folk who are somebody. And the God we serve is a God of somebodies. I got to get out of here. And then Saul. Come here, Saul. Saul got the nerves to take off his armor and try to put it on David. Now you know it don't fit. David said, that don't fit. Take it off, David. It don't fit. David said, I don't need your armor. I'm a champion. See, that armor wasn't made for David. That armor was made for Saul. But David had an armor that you couldn't see. He had the sword, uh, the, which is a, which he had the sword, which is the word of God. He had the helmet of salvation. He was girded with the truth. He already had armor on. And on the way there, David stopped by the stream and he picked up five smooth stones. He only needed one, but he picked up five because he knew that Goliath had four other brothers. And you know how folk are when you kill one giant? The giants keep on coming. And he gets down there with nothing but a slingshot. And when he gets down there with that slingshot, he begins to challenge, oh, Goliath, come on, son, face Goliath. Let Goliath start swinging your slingshot. Goliath is laughing. 
Look at him. Look at that champion. Ain't that a champion? Look at him. Goliath was covered from head to toe. He only had one vulnerable place in his armor, and it was right here. And as David, come on, David, began to swing that slingshot, the Holy Ghost must have come down from glory, began to guide his arms. And when David threw that slingshot and released that rock, you only heard two hits. The rock hitting Goliath. And Goliath, get on the ground, Goliath. Goliath. Lay it out. Don't, don't, don't mess up your suit, but stay right there. But can I tell you, if you want to get ahead in life, you got to go a little further. When your giant is down, can I tell y'all how to get ahead in life? David walked over to Goliath, took his sword out. Don't put your foot on him. Take his sword out. Now, let me tell you how to get ahead in life. He cut off his head, picked it up, because God gave him the victory. Go and walk around, David, like you somebody with Goliath's head in your hand, because God gave him the victory. Do I have any giant killers in the house? Do I have any champions in the house? Come on, come on. Say, stay here, stay here. And David wrote, David wrote a few years later. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, yay! Do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, 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 surely. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, whoo, good God, in the house of the Lord forever. See, I like that psalm, but we missed something, Doc. David said, God got a hedge around me. Come here, David. Come here, David. Come here, David. Stand right here. David said, I got the rod on one side. I got the staff on the other side. I got goodness behind me. I got mercy in front of me. Y'all walk with it. Everywhere I go, I'm covered on all sides because I got the rod on one side. Got the staff on the other side. Got goodness behind me. Mercy. Go oh, turn around. Turn around. Walk that way. Walk that way. Keep David in the middle. Walk that way. See him covered on every side. That's why I'm a champion. I can't lose. And I thank God for his mercy. Y'all give them a hand as they go to their seat. And I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I need some mercy. Anybody here need some mercy? I need some mercy. One day, justice and mercy decided to meet to resolve the sins of humankind. Justice said, let's meet at the conference room tomorrow about 12 noon. And then justice was on time because justice is straight. Justice goes by the tick-tock of the clock. Justice gives us just what we deserve. But mercy was running late. Don't you know justice sat down at the conference room table, started looking for mercy, and mercy was running late, and justice was getting agitated, and justice got up and said, I'm about to leave mercy. No, I don't play that. If I said 12, I mean 12. If I say one, I mean one. It was about 11.59 in a few seconds and counting. About that time, justice closed up his briefcase. He was getting ready to walk out, and as he walked out the door, he saw coming over the horizon a shadowy figure. It was all wet, bloody, looked like it had been in a fight. And as it got closer, he said, wait a minute. 
Is that mercy? He said, that can't be mercy. You all bloody. Your clothes all tore up. You all raggly. Look like you've been in a fight. Look like you've been in a fire. Look like you fought some wild beasts. And then mercy said, justice. I'm sorry. I was running late for the meeting. But just as I set out to make the meeting, I heard Moses over at the Red Sea with two mountains on the left and the right. The Red Sea in front of him and the Egyptian army coming up behind him. And I heard him cry to God, Lord, have mercy on me. And I called on the wind and the wind went down and it split the Red Sea and fanned the bottom dry. And then the Israelites walked through the Red Sea kicking up dust on dry ground. And after they got through, the Egyptian army went down and I allowed the Red Sea to collapse on every last one of them and they died. That's why my clothes are all wet. But I still could have made it there on time. But just when I left the Red Sea, I heard Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over at the fiery furnace. And they said, Lord, have mercy on me. And I jumped down in the fiery furnace. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked over, he said, didn't we throw three? But I see a fourth one. And he looked like the son of man. He was talking about me. And I condition that fiery furnace and when the boys came out they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them that's why my clothes all burn up but I still could have made it on time but just as I was leaving the fiery furnace I heard Daniel over at the lion's den say Lord have mercy on me Daniel had been praying to his God. And there was a decree passed that if you were found praying to your God, you would be thrown into the lion's den. Prayer got him in trouble. But I dropped by to tell you, if prayer gets you in trouble, then prayer can get you out of trouble. He was praying before he went in. He was praying when they threw him in. And he was praying while he was in. And the next day, when they opened the lion's den, with my sanctified imagination, I can see Daniel laying on one lion like he's a mattress. Got his foot up on another lion like he's a footrest. Got his arms up on two lions like they armrest. Got his head on another lion like it's a pillar. God took the appetite out of the lion. But that's why my clothes are all tore up. But I still could have made it there on time. But I heard David over there in the valley of Elah say, Lord, have mercy on me. And I began to guide that stone from that slingshot. And Goliath went down dead. And I cut off his head through David. That's why my clothes are all bloody. But I still could have made it on time. But over there at Calvary, on my way to Golgotha, I allowed them to scourge me. They put a crown of some 72 thorns on my brow. They led me down the Via Dolorosa. They laid me low. They stretched me wide, put nails in my hand, nails in my feet, and they lifted up that cross. But I told them if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. And then I hung bled and died on that cross for nine long excruciating hours. And then I looked to the heavens and said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Into thy hands I commend my spirit. I gave up the ghost. Pilate didn't take my life. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That's the question that you and I need to answer. That's the question that rings in my ears today. Wh what would it profit me? What would it profit you if we got all of the things we wanted? We, we got the right job. We got the right income. We got the right house. We got the right car. We got all of the things we wanted. 
and then lost our soul. That's sad. And, 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 and so you really want to know what the Blessing Connection program is all about. It, it's about helping me. It's about helping you. It's about helping men and women be able to stand before God and hear God say in the life to come, well done. Don't you want to hear God say, well done? I want to hear God say, well done, our good and faithful servant. And so as you watch these videos of people getting baptized, understand what baptism really means. Baptism is really a symbolic act. It represents the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It, it represents the fact that I have given my life, I am being buried, I am being raised again to live a new life in Christ Jesus. It's, it's the opportunity for me to stand before God and hear God say, the substitution death of Jesus Christ, I no longer see you, I see him. It's Christ taking my place. It's not about my works. It's about the grace of God and that God sent his only begotten son. And so when you see someone get baptized, what they're really saying is that I've heard the good news that God sent his only begotten son. I believe that Jesus is God's son. I will confess with my mouth proudly that Jesus Christ is the son of God. I will repent of my sin. I no longer want to sit on the throne. I want Jesus to sit on the throne. I'm going down. I am getting baptized because I want to be able to say it's no longer I who lives in me. It's Christ who lives in me. That's what the passage is about in Romans chapter six, verse number four. Let me read it to you. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father, we, that's you and I, we too may live a new life. Well, that's the plan of salvation. And for today, that's the blessing connection. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's our joy to uh, share this program with men and women around the world. And I pray it blessed your life. Our service times begin on Sunday morning with Bible study at 9 a.m. with classes for all ages, morning worship, 10 a.m., evening worship, 5 p.m. And on Wednesdays, our midweek Bible study begins at 7 p.m. Please come and be our guest. If you are calling to request prayer, please dial 1-855-45-CONNECT. Our Twitter account is at Connect With Him. If you would like to purchase, call 1-855-45-CONNECT. 